Welcome back to another episode of Introductory Organic Chemistry. Today we're going to talk about mastering SN2 and E2 through some stuff we haven't talked about previously. But before we get into that, let's go through the practice problems I assigned last lecture. So I gave you this compound and I asked you to suggest a base for the following transformation. Now in this case, we can just use terputoxide or another strong base such as sodium methoxide, which would just deprotonate this position and form the alkene. In this case, there's only really one elimination reaction that could happen because this phenoxide would be a much poorer leaving group. So we obtain this sole product using a strong base such as terputoxide. Now in the next example, we asked whether we could use a specific base to affect uh, and cause this resulting transformation to get this alkene. Now, there's also this methyl position here. And so this methyl group has three protons that something like terputoxide, which is a little bit bulkier, would prefer to abstract first. So to get the following product, we could just use DBU. And it's actually a strong enough base for this transformation. If you're interested in the paper where they show this type of transformation, you can look at this DOI down here. Okay, before we get into the main material today, uh, we're gonna talk about these three reagents. DDQ, DMDO, and ozone. These three reagents are all specific oxidants with specific applications. Um, they're ones worth being familiar with when you hear these uh, abbreviations because they're used all the time. DDQ is commonly used for deprotecting certain uh, oxidatively labile functional groups or protecting groups. So this would be like certain benzyl ethers, for instance, would be easily cleaved with DDQ. DMDO is a reagent used to synthesize epoxides, and ozone is a reagent commonly used to cleave olefins into aldehydes or ketones. So with that, let's get into the main material for today, SN2 and E2. So when you're doing an SN2 reaction, uh, if you have a chiral leaving group in the first place, you'll get uh, the opposite enantiomer uh, in the product. So here we have bromide getting displaced by azide, and so if we started with the out of the plane bromide will get the into the plane azide. Um, the reason that this occurs uh, is due to the reaction occurring via backside attack. And so here you can see the nucleophile, in this case azide, approaching and attacking from 180 degrees away and displacing the bromide as a leaving group. And when that occurs, we have the inversion of the stereocenter. So this is an inversion uh, of a substituted uh, bromide. So uh, what you could also do if you want to accelerate SN2 reactions is add in a little bit of iodide, for instance. So if you have a bromide or a chloride and you use iodide, you can substitute the bromide and get an iodide. Now, the problem if you use excess iodide in a non-catalytic amount, what can happen is this iodide can get attacked and displaced by another iodide, like this. Second iodide comes in, displaces the first iodide, and you get this uh, inverted product. And so this is what leads to uh, racemization. The other thing is, uh, if you were to try and accelerate a substitution of a secondary position like this, you might get the wrong product afterwards if you only used a substoichiometric amount of iodide, as the iodide would first form with the inverted stereochemistry, and then once displaced by a nucleophile, you'd have the out-of-the-plane product, just like the bromide. So it's uh, something that you can use for like primary substitution quite well, but it isn't something you see used very often in uh, uh, secondary position substitutions. Um, so most of the time for SN2 reactions, you don't see optically pure secondary iodides because if iodide left as a leaving group from your iodide uh, and you formed your product in some amount, the resulting iodide from that first reaction would still be kicking around and it could scatter the stereocenter uh, of your optically pure alkyl iodide. Now, if you're doing different chemistry with the optically pure iodide, you might be able to still retain the stereochemistry, but most of the time you wouldn't want to do that for SN2 reactions. So if you're displacing a bromide or a chloride, those salts tend to precipitate and they don't usually participate in much other chemistry. So if you uh, have a secondary or primary, or sorry, uh, if you have a secondary bromide or chloride, typically the stereochemistry will be uh, retained after substitution. And when I say retained, I mean, you won't lose any optical purity between the starting material and the product as the chloride or the bromide are removed from the reaction effectively by precipitating. But iodide salts tend to be quite polar, or uh, quite soluble rather in, uh, polar solvents such as acetonitrile or acetone. Um, so if you have a primary alkyl chloride, for instance, uh, and you want to substitute it uh, with something like a phosphine, this would be a quite slow reaction. However, if you add in a little bit of iodide, this will accelerate the reaction quite drastically from a reaction that would take multiple days at reflux into a reaction that could take two hours at reflux. So the use of iodide for substitution of primary halides is often quite advantageous. And if you're not sure if a reaction will work, oftentimes people will just dump in a catalytic amount of iodide anyway. 
Okay, next, uh, another consideration for SN2 reactions is whether or not the leaving group is neopental. So a neopental group is just when you have a tert butyl group before you have a primary or secondary position with a halide on there. And so even though you might think, well, this is still a primary position, we should still be able to displace this quite easily, it actually isn't the case, and this is just due to steric bulk. So there's another type of SN2 uh, consideration that we should be thinking about. And so the first one is whether or not we have like an allylic position, for instance. And so here we have an allylic halide, for instance. This nucleophile will come in and displace the halide, and you'll get the nucleophile substituted at that position. However, when you have allylic halides, the nucleophile can also tack at the olefin, and when the electron density of the nucleophile enters into that carbon, the electron density of the alkene can migrate to the neighboring two carbons and displace the halide as a leaving group. And so in this case here, we would get the same product because uh, if you just like rotate this around 180 degrees, it's the same. But if we had a, an example like this cinnamyl chloride, what would actually happen is you get a mixture of products, uh, both a mixture of enantiomers of this product as well as uh, substitution at a different position. So the next consideration here is uh, looking at E2 groups. So if we're trying to do an elimination reaction, the proton on the adjacent carbon needs to be 180 degrees apart from the leaving group for elimination to occur. Uh, the useful thing about this is if we have substituents on those two carbons, we can actually predict the geometry of the resulting alkene if we're having a typical E2 anti-periplanar uh, elimination. There are some types of eliminations in organic chemistry which don't occur via anti-periplanar uh, uh, geometry. And when those reactions occur, you'll get different geometry olefins. But in the case of E2 eliminations, these will typically occur via anti-periplanar geometry. Now, another consideration is when you start looking at whether or not you have syn or anti-periplanar geometry. So this could be in an example of like a cycloalkane, so like these cyclohexanes. In this case here, we can see that the chloride and the proton are still anti to each other as there's like a proton sticking up here off of this carbon. So this proton would be syn with this proton. However, the chloride would be syn with this uh, proton, or it would be anti with this proton rather. And so what can happen is if one of these protons gets deprotonated here, you can't displace the chloride because they're not 180 degrees apart. They need to be antiperiplanar. So before this can occur, this has to undergo a ring flip so that the chloride and the proton are both axial. If they're both axial, they're 180 degrees apart and this uh, elimination can occur. Now, because there's a proton on either side of this molecule, you'll get both enantiomers uh, shown here. And so this is just the overall reaction showing that this chloride uh, once treated with a base will afford a mixture of these two products. So if you have a case where you have one proton which is anti and another proton which is syn, most of the time we think, oh, it's just an elimination, but it doesn't work that way. So you have to have that anti-periplanar geometry, and in the case of a cyclohexane, that means that the chloride and the proton that's getting displaced, or uh, deprotonated rather, must be anti to the leaving group. So in this case, only the blue proton will be deprotonated, and so you'll get only one product. If you have a case where there's no antiprotons, then you could get a very, very slow elimination, but it isn't occurring through antiperiplanar geometry. So most of the time you won't see anything like that. So for practice for next lecture, I'd like to assign two problems. First, with this chloride here, show which products would form when treated with sodium cyanide and uh, elaborate on what mechanism they uh, form through. Uh, additionally, predict the product of the following reaction. So we have this dichloride and we treat it with a base. Uh, what would be the product? And so with that, hopefully this has been helpful for finishing off E2 and SN2 reactions. Next lecture, we'll start getting into SN1 and E1 reactions. And with that, I hope you have a great day. If you have any comments or questions, please leave them below and I'd be happy to uh, receive any criticism that you might have about the series. Thank you.